What are the latest technology trends in the Middle East? Expo 2020 Dubai, what can we expect? The big question, Samsung or Apple in the Middle East? We'll find out right after this. Hi, welcome to the Zada Show. I am Nazca Zada. Today we have Roy Wong. He is chairman of Silicon Valley based Constellation Research and the author of the popular business strategy and technology blog, A Software Insider's Point of View. His Silicon Valley research firm advises global 2000 companies on the future business strategy and disruptive technology adoption and he's also host of disrupt tv ray wong welcome to the zada show hey how you doing this is amazing what's Thank up you. oh we are doing great and it's always so great to have you we love your energy and the knowledge you share with us tell us about the latest technology in the middle east you know, we are seeing IoT smart cities take place. A lot of it's happening because of the Expo 2020 in Dubai, they are basically on fire for a showcase of innovation. I think it's gonna be one of the most exciting Expo. It's not just the construction build out that's going on, but it's also the technology and innovation that's actually happening there. I mean, every host country that's there um, is doing something really interesting, whether it's around the future of healthcare that's going on at Dubai Exposition Center, whether it's actually just the build out in terms of the technology going to these smart cities. Um, you know, you're seeing the roads actually being expanded. You're seeing like the way ticketing is actually done at this event is actually gonna be very interesting as well. We're gonna see like lots of different countries. Um, we're gonna see like a blockchain. And so this is actually gonna be one of those shows that people are not gonna wanna miss uh, in terms of, you know, just the creative energy that's actually coming in that area. Are you gonna be there yourself? I really hope to, uh, it's <laughs> on my list. So, um, you know, some of our previous clients and clients as well are out in Dubai. We, we, we love what they do. And, uh, you know, we're definitely gonna be there to help support them as well, so. Yes, and you mentioned um, artificial technology is a big thing. Seems like not many people know about the Middle East and, you know, uh, when it comes to artificial technology. Uh, but tell us, is like, is it that they use it more uh, in healthcare system compared to the rest of the world? You know, we see AI being used in all different areas, right? As you can imagine, security is a really big area where artificial intelligence is being applied. AI technologies are really important, um, even in fraud and banking and financial services. We see that play a big role as well. Um, and we're also starting to see it being used in customer experience, trying to transform experiences, right? You've got world-class properties out there. You've got a lot of uh, customer facing consumer organizations coming about, right? If you think about, you know, the, the, the level of, folks that in terms of their age and what's going on in the Middle East, right? It's a very young population, a very savvy population. And because of that, uh, everyone's trying to figure out, you know, what they can do to improve that customer experience and what happens in the workspace as well. Yes. And what um, some people don't know about the Middle East, they are very trendy. So if there's the latest technology, if some one person has it, everyone has to have, you know, that piece of technology. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, you know, that's everything from consumer stuff to what they're doing to the latest gadgets. Uh, so we, we definitely have a lot of trends that are going on there as well. Yes. And let's talk about, since we're talking about um, gadgets and all of that, there's a new iPhone coming out soon, tomorrow. But, you know, tell us about that. What should we expect from that one? Yeah, so... I think you're going to see an extra camera is kind of the rumor that's out there. Um, you're going to see <laughs> just like Samsung. You know, yeah, you're going to see a little extra camera. You're going to see some more AR, VR, but you can see a lot of integration with the health side. That's one of the things Apple has been doing a really good job with. It's really about integrating uh, health capabilities from not just the uh, heart rate, uh, but also tying up to other health services that are out there. Uh, and the important thing to realize about the Apple model is they're not trying to sell ads. Uh, they're basically in a subscription-based type of approach. And so their job is to, you know, take that personalization and, and really help you 
you know, expand upon it. So you see it with the, you know, the Apple credit card, for example, like uh, right here, I happen to have it here. So, you know, this is really the beginning of like what they want to do with payments and other areas, right? Oh, uh, can you, can you hold a little bit? Yeah, here, let me show that to you here real quick. Uh, yeah, so you got one of these, so yeah. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, so so that's what's going on. But but in the Middle East, I mean, to be honest, right? Samsung is still the dominant player. It's probably got yeah, some. I was about to ask you. Twenty nine percent. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, because uh, we were just talking about that before we go on the air. Samsung or Apple or iPhone in the Middle East, and you research. You're like, hold on, let me uh, double check. So go ahead. Samsung is like more popular. Samsung is definitely more popular in the Middle East. They've got a 28, 29% market share. <laughs> Huawei is up there as well. I think they've got something in the 20s. They're about 25%. Apple's sitting somewhere between 14, 15% of the market share. Um, the real reason to use Apple in the Middle East um, for a lot of folks, it's, it's whether it's UI or UX, but it's also about security, right? Making sure that you know they've got the right security model in place and the way that the texts are I mean, you can't really, well, you can kind of hack it, but I think it's probably the, one of the harder phones to hack, you know, especially in iMessage and in iCloud. You know, they've done a good job on privacy. But from a cost and value perspective, you know, this is why we see Samsung and Huawei uh, in that market and doing really well. Yes, because when it comes to Samsung and app, uh, iPhone, the price is about the same, right? It is, but if you're talking at the high end, right? A Galaxy Note versus a high end iPhone. Mm -hmm. Like I just got my Samsung Galaxy Note 10. It's sitting there, right? You know, the, the pen is pretty cool. The augmented reality. How about, picture, how about the motion when you take picture like that? It's so cool. <laughs> it is, and you can you can move with it, right? I mean, there's all these yeah, other things yeah. that you can do. And, and, and I, I think that's that's what makes it very popular. Plus, plus the pictures. I mean, the camera is amazing, oh, right? God, the yeah. camera quality, people really enjoy that. And, uh, you know, so, so I think, you know, there's a little bit for everyone. People like different things, you know, um, I mean, I think in North America, iPhones are still very dominant and, and that's why people use iMessage, they use other services, right? But in other parts of the world, like in China, I mean, iPhone has a very, very small market share. Like Samsung doesn't even have a presence in China anymore, right? It's all local oh, wow. phones and a little bit of iPhone. So, so we, we see that it's very regional in terms of what people choose. Um, I know our topic is not China and technology, but how that Chinese, um, phone compared to Samsung and um, iPhone? Well, if you're looking at price things, uh, you know, Samsung just announced the Fold. Huawei also announced a foldable phone as well. Um, Samsung actually just released it uh, a, a few days ago. And I think that's kind of exciting. So back to a different form factor uh, in terms of what people do. Um, in China, um, the local phones do really well. Right, Huawei, Xiaomi, right? There's a whole bunch of local companies that actually produce phones, right? They have a good handle in the domestic market. It just comes down to cost, right? There's a huge premium to a Samsung phone and an Apple phone. Uh, Huawei is definitely a value oriented phone and, and definitely a phone for the masses. So it's a lot cheaper to buy local phones than. Uh... Definitely in China. And, and plus, there's a little uh, anti Americanism going on at the moment. So <laughs> let's not talk about that because we're not talking about China right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, no. Uh, yes, <laughs> um, we're talking about um, Samsung and obviously it's winning in the Middle East. As I predicted, I didn't even know, I didn't research. I'm like, hmm, if I know Middle East well, because of um, most Samsung phones, they have three cameras and they have cool um, you know, apps to take pictures. And I'm like, if I know that, I think that might be more popular, but there we go. Well, it is, right? I mean, I think if you think about how family oriented the Middle East is, right, you know, the pictures are a big part of it, right? And, and having the ability to access high quality pictures, be able to take your selfies, just edit movies, right? I mean, th those are all very, very important. And, and I think that's, that, that's what drives it. And you can't, you know, people stream a lot in the Middle East, much more than the US. I mean, it's not like we don't stream, but streaming, the gaming aspects, right? I mean, oh. so, so you, you want really a lot of people like the rich quality screen, screens that they're getting as well. So, so the Samsung oh, screens are Oh, I didn't are, know that about gorgeous. Middle East that they stream a lot. Why do you think they stream more than you, the U.S.? Um, we see a lot of streaming, especially on how content's being distributed. So we just have many more formats. Um, we're not particularly limited to a mobile device. Um, so people, a lot more people have laptops, computers, right, and, and other areas. Whereas in, in the Middle East, this, this could be the primary device. Oh. But I didn't know that. Let's go to India. And then um, their spacecraft crashed. 
how is that like what's going on and i know they located the spacecraft but um the condition is unknown ah the vikram lunar lander um, <laughs> last yeah. time we talked about israel remember it was the same situation i i know so okay so landing something on the moon is pretty hard right like you think hitting a golf ball is hard this is like ten thousand times harder right so you know the, the challenge here is that you know this, it's, it's not an easy task. It's definitely a great goal for people to do. Um, and it really depends on where, where the, you know, where the lunar orbiter lands, right? Apparently it's still operational. It's gonna be operational for a while. Um, but what was interesting about this was it was an all women team, right? If, if I remember this is uh, mm -hmm. and so they're able to get that team up there. And, and so, you know, it, look, it's, it's, it's one of those things that gets a country excited. You get proud of the fact that, Hey, look, you know, it landed. Okay. So it landed, we couldn't find it. Okay. That's all right. Right. But the point being is the fact that they actually got it to you know, land. Uh, and, and I think that's not bad. And, and the fact that, you know, they only did it for one hundred forty million dollars. That's pretty impressive. Right. That, that's, oh, wow. you know, I mean, that's a pretty low cost to actually send a lander uh, and, and, and actually satellite into orbit. Um, and more importantly, right. I mean, that's probably less than the production cost of a, a couple of Bollywood movies. Right. That, that, that's a have to look at this. Yes, and um, uh, how about the conspiracy theory that the ETs um, got something to do with that? <laughs> okay, the moon is probably no. I'm just kidding. The moon is not. <laughs> now we're doing uh, Bollywood movies. <laughs> it's not like the Mars rover, right? You know, like someone just turned off the Mars rover just didn't tell us, right? I mean, there's always these kind of theories that are up there. Like, did the U.S. actually even land the lunar lander? Like, you know, did people actually step on the moon? I look. I, I think you know. I think we'll find out over time, but I'm sure that, you know, they, a lot of things can go wrong on a space mission. I mean, these are extremely complicated. Uh, it's not just the technology, it's the physics that's around it. It's, it's also like, um, you know, there are a lot of conditions that you might not expect. So, so I think, you know, that, it's actually cool, right? One of, one of the interesting things that they proved here was variable thrust um, programming, the propulsion that they actually did uh, for the lander. So, you know, you know, it's, it worked mostly the way they wanted to. And I think that's, that's, that's pretty exciting, especially if you're, in, if you're in India and you're looking at this, it's like, hey, you know, the U.S. didn't send the first, the first rocket that we sent probably just got self-destructed, sure. yeah. right? We had a lot of accidents on the way to the moon. Um, the Russians had the same thing. Uh, I'm sure the Chinese have, they just haven't told us about it. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you'll see lots of, you'll see lots of this in, in, in our attempt to do this, but, but there is going to be a race to not just colonize the moon. It's also for some of the rare earth, uh, rare materials that are up there, um, looking at different types of material science areas. Um, people are trying to figure out like what they can bring back, what's useful up there. So, so we will see some colonization, probably not in our lifetime. I'd love to say it's in our lifetime, but maybe our children's lifetime as people, you know, Try to try to you know, colonize and, and actually live on the moon. This the whole topic of the moon and landing and colonization is fascinating, right? We can do a whole show on it. Um, but I want to talk about uh, beside Dubai 2020. What should we expect in the Middle East? Because 2020 is coming, and what do you think next year uh, gonna be like? trends, tech trends, or, or anything else in the Middle East? So it used to be, right? It used to be like, we're like, oh my God, you know, 2000, a new century, or like 2020, right? It's gonna be like oh so far God. away, yeah. It's only a few months away. I mean, it, it, it's scary. We are three to four months away from 2020, right? So, so what can we expect? Um, I, I think if we think about the larger trends that are happening on the technology side, we're, we are definitely, we're definitely going to see a, uh, a push into augmented reality, uh, extended reality. I think that's going to transform a lot of the way we look at entertainment, the way we look at advertising, the way we use, I mean, especially when we're talking about phones, right? The ability to put AR, VR onto the phone, um, be able to, I and mean, we already have it, right? People like have all those cool, like, you know, visual arts, little sticky, little selfie things, a little animation that's going on, right? That's just the beginning. Now imagine that as, you know, guiding you to an ad, taking you through the maps, getting you through the Dubai airport, for example, like, you know, guiding you through on the way there, right? That awesome. plus 5G are probably the two biggest things that people are going to see immediately, right? Some of the services that are being connected on the 5G route and, and really about how those services actually change people's lives, right? Maybe you'll find traffic faster. Maybe you'll do two or three things you couldn't do before. Maybe people can deliver emergency services and first responder services much more effectively. So, so that's probably the first two things that will happen. 
The other stuff that's happening is going to take a little bit more time, like autonomous vehicles, right? Seriously, I think we're still 10 years. I was just thinking about that. I'm like, are we going to see that in our lifetime? We're going to see demos. We're going to see demos. We'll definitely see in our lifetime. Here's my thing. Like if you can make an autonomous vehicle work in India, you'll be fine. Right. I mean, you're like four lane highway has like seven lanes of cars, right? Some cars are coming at you, right? There's cows coming at you. There's people coming at you. No one's in the right direction, right? But it's in synchronized chaos. It is massively synchronized chaos as people like get around. Um, and so it's, it's impressive, but you got to be able to handle anything. And, and I think until you test it in India, it doesn't mean anything, right? So, so we'll know like how well it does uh, probably in 10 to 15 years. It's going to take some time, but along the way, Right. We're going to see different types of services that might actually help you drive better or might actually you know, help people with assisted driving. Right. We might not get the full autonomous vehicles in a level five AV, but we'll get close. We'll get level three, level four, assisted driving, guiding, safety, collision avoidance. All those kind of things might pop up. So and, and maybe it helps us with better, better parking. Right? You know, that, that would be great, too. So that's pretty well. Yes. I'm, I wonder, I wonder where you're going to park your car. <laughs> you may never have to. Have right. So. We just leave it at the space. So, yeah. <laughs> That's very interesting. I am really fascinated by technology. I know it's frustrating for some people because especially you mentioned the virtual reality and reality. Even, I don't know about you, I myself sometimes I'm like, okay, was that something I saw or was it just my thinking? because it's so confusing. <laughs> oh, deep fakes, deep fakes is a huge area, right? We're gonna see deep fakes pop up. How do we determine a deep fake? Can we use artificial intelligence to tell when something has been faked? Is it real, is content okay? I mean, these deep fakes videos could actually create riots anywhere around the world. So I think there's a lot of attention being right now to help people spot when a video is real, when it's not, when it's been doctored, when certain items are, are not the original or authentic. So I think we're going to see a big push in there, especially in the digital world. Um, especially governments are trying to make sure that that you know that there there there's no way like a riot occurs because someone faked a fake there's a fake a video and filmed it in a way that people said, oh my god, you know something is wrong, right? So so we're going to see that, especially in the digital world, right? That's definitely another area. Oh, that that's that's good news. I didn't know that that's possible because, as you know, you are on Twitter a lot and you're very popular, obviously there that it's sometimes you you get so confused you wake up you think actually this happened but because 20 people retweeted the same news and it's actually from uh you know it's fake news it's from it's a, an, an authorized source it could be a campaign it could be a disinformation campaign like we definitely see that i mean look 2020 is going to be a crazy year for elections in the U.S. You're going to expect a lot of this going on. A lot of people have different interests. You know, whether you like certain presidents, don't like certain presidents, certain candidates, you're going to expect a, a lot of crackdown on this. Yes. Ray Wong, thank you so much for this great interview. Oh, Naska, happy to be here. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this interview, please hit the like button and also subscribe to our YouTube channel at The Zada Show. And also be sure that you follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time, bye.